So last time we were talking about how to use summary statistics to understand the results of multiple runs. This time uh, we're going to talk about a different way to do it, which is the use of graphs. So graphs of your analysis results provide a visual way to summarize the data. I, I don't want to say that they are better or worse in any sense than summary statistics. They're just different. Some people like the summary statistics better. Some people like the graphs better. A lot of times there is kind of more information in the graphs, uh, but sometimes it's harder to actually interpret the graphs, right? And many different graphs can be created, have been created. Um, and one of the things that I always find it's useful to do, kind of getting back uh, to not just assuming that the summary statistics are right, is by looking at all the data. So that's what we're first going to do. We're going to look at how to create all the data. And again, this is something that's easy uh, to do in R. Uh, so I'm just going to skip over there and uh, we'll talk about how to do this in R. Okay, we're back in R, picking up where we left off. And if you remember, uh, we had uh, just pulled in all the data, we had aggregated it, uh, we had then looked at the summary statistics results, right? Um, and, you know, in fact, in one case we were interested, like, is this a meaningful difference between 150 and 200? So the next lines of this piece of code, which again will be in the footnotes below, is that we're going to look at actually plotting the data. And then in R, there's a standard command called plot, and the first input is whatever you want to be on the x-axis. So we want the number of people, right, from the original data on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you want the output variable, which in this case is the last tick. Uh, we're then going to give it a title, which is just you know what it's called. So it's main, the main title is time to 100% infection versus initial population. We have to give the x label, x sorry, x-axis a label, which is the initial number of people, and the y-axis a label, right? And so when we do all that, right, and we hit uh, the command enter, right, we get this nice graph where we can see the spread of the data, right? And as you can see, right, there is kind of a bigger spread at 50, it's more stochastic, and it goes down over time, but the 200 and 150 are pretty darn close to each other in terms of the, um, of the mean values, right, or in terms of the overall spreads of the data, and we haven't actually looked at the means yet in this particular graph, right? But, so if you want to save that off, this is called a quartz window in R, and so you just say quartz.save, and then you tell it where you want it to save it, and I can save that data off um, to a file so that I could then embed it in a Word document, whatever I want, PowerPoint, et cetera, right? Um, now that's how to look at all of the data, right? But often what we really want to do is we want to provide some sort of summary graph of that data using those means and standard deviations that we were previously looking at, right? So in that case, we're actually not going to use the plot command. We're going to use the error bar command because the error bar command allows us to add error bars to those plots. And in this case, we're gonna use one standard deviation error bars. So the X value, so again, we gotta give it the X value, which is the initial number of people, the Y value, which is the last tick, right? And then we have to tell it what the error bar below should look like and what the error bar above each of the Y values should look like. So it's gonna be the last tick Sorry, it's, it's above and then below. The last tick plus the standard deviation, and then the last tick minus the standard deviation, right? And again, we can label the x-axis, the y-axis. And in this case, we're gonna tell it, rather than plotting, if we had left this command off, it would've just plotted the points with the error bars. We're gonna tell it we wanna connect a line because we are increasing a value, and that value is a continuous variable, and so we can kind of plot a line between them, right? Um, and then after that, we add the main title. For some reason, a lot of times an error bar, putting main in the actual plotting command doesn't seem to work. But if you just put the command title and then put main, it will add it to a plot that already exists. So if we execute both of these commands, right, and then we pull up our quartz window, right, we can now see this nice graph uh, that shows the relationships, right? Okay, so if we are interested in actually looking at the, the, the underlying data and the variance, and we want to make a statement about how varied that data is, then what we just did was completely correct. But if instead what we really wanted to do was look at trying to compare the means of these different, th the different variables and see if they overlap, then we actually need to not use standard deviation, but standard error. Standard error is simply a, the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of data points. 
And what that means is that as you increase the number of data points you accumulate, you become more and more confident in what that mean actually is, right? So what I've done here in, in, in an add-on to the R code, right, is I first define the number of runs because we need to know that because that's the number of data points, right? So I take the size of the original data set and I divide by the size of the aggregated data set. And as long as we, the thing that we're aggregating has the same number of representations in the data set, right, that will tell us the number of runs. And then I take that last tick variable in the SD category uh, data set and I divide by the square root of the number of runs to give us the standard error. Now I'm gonna replot the same exact command as before, but instead of using the last tick, the standard deviation, I'm gonna use the standard error as my error bars, right? And once we've done all of that, right, um, and we pull up our quartz window again, you see that the error bars have shrunk substantially. This is indicating that even though the variance of the underlying data is fairly high, we have a pretty good confidence in what the actual underlying uh, value of the mean of any data that we draw from that population will be, right? Now, you'll notice that, you know, of course, it's much, the confidence is much higher for 200 where the, the underlying values are, are lower. I should mention, you know, we can't, like, these give us a visual inspection. If these error bars were to overlap, we would know for a fact that they are not a statistically significant. But the fact that they don't overlap doesn't actually provide us with perfect confidence that they, that they, are, uh, uh, st that they are statistically significant in terms of their differences. We would actually have to then run, like, a student's t-test or something like that to compare the underlying data to determine if these values are statistically significant. But using standard error does give you a better sense of how confident you are in the differences between two means uh, than using standard deviation. So there we go. We now have a summary graph of our initial results. It seems to indicate that, that it's definitely the case that as population density goes up, the time to reverse that infection goes down, but it is in a nonlinear manner, right? And um, it does appear like that the difference is starting to collapse between these means, even though some of them are different from each other, right? Um, or appear to be different. We, like I said, we'd have to do a test to check it out. So there you go. That answers our initial investigation.